we are Steve and Jill. Together, we've been buying and reselling land since the 90s. Our data-centric approach leaves our buyers asking, how can you sell it so cheap? Here on the Land Academy Show, we answer that and more. Jack and Jill here. Hello. Welcome to the Land Academy Show, entertaining land investment talk. I'm Stephen Jack Butella. And I'm Jill DeWitt, broadcasting from the Valley of the Sun. Today, Jill and I talk about why land uh, land ownership is ideal against 2023 inflation. I sleep really well at night. I always have. Yeah, me too. I always have the way we buy and sell land. I never, I just, you, you, there's nothing better. I don't care what it is. Even even over having a safe full of precious metals, seriously, which is good to have too, don't get me wrong. But having land, it's just like, wow, it's, it's different. There's no feeling like it, mm-hmm. quite like owning a bunch of land. Yep. So even if I complain like, oh, it's not selling fast enough, or you're complaining it's not selling fast enough, hold on a moment. Let's take a step back and realize what's going on here. You're in a good spot. Before we get into it, let's take a question posted by one of our members on the landinvestors.com online community. It's free. Last year, a ton of Land Academy members came to uh, Jill and I needing extra help to get their blind offer campaigns in the mail. So I took a look at how we were personally sending out mail and our key employees, uh, with our key employees, and ultimately made the same people available to Land Academy members to get their mail campaigns out. We now call it Concierge Data, uh, and we launched a new product recently called Concierge Data Plus. It allows you to send out or, or outsource your entire mailer to uh, offers to owners. Give us a call, or uh, actually just go to offers the number two owners.com, poke around. And uh, we'll see, you know, check it out, see if it's for you. Cool. Kevin wrote, hello, newbie question. On the Zillow sold comps, why might the time between pending sale and sold be a long time, like three months plus? And does that potentially make it a worse comp to use? I have one. I have one reason right, right now, Kevin. That's manually entered by a real person who did the listing. That's kind of it. When it so that it's not automatically marked sold or pending. I'm surprised they even put pending in there. Some agents don't even do that. They'll just put listed, price change, and then sold because they're busy. They're doing other deals too. So I take that with a grain of salt because it is totally, like I said, a manual entry if used at all. If you uh, list a piece of property with a real estate agent. Mm-hmm. They're going to put it on the multiple listing service, the MLS, and there's they're very regulated on how they uh, input the data. It's very if you've ever posted anything on the MLS or been involved in it, it's a one day process. So there's a lot involved, and and they're required by their broker and all kinds of stuff. So that when it goes under contract, it goes to pending. When it's sold, it gets removed from the MLS or gets marked sold. That is absolutely not the case with Zillow. Zillow uh, as a for sale by owner, we can put stuff in Zillow. There's no regulations about taking it off the market when it went. Jill's exactly right. There's no rules. Mm-hmm. So very often people just leave it on there and it's mm-hmm. not for sale at all. Or they'll post something that's fictitious. So you have to be careful about how you use Zillow and and how you look at the comparison values. The exact same thing is uh, true with Landwatch. Exactly the same thing. Mm-hmm. So there's MLS places, multiple listing service play, uh, ways to post property, and then free form, you know, user content driven. Mm-hmm. Redfin is an IDX feed, just like Realtor.com. Those are all real real estate agent driven uh, with rules. I like to use all of them. You know what? I'm still going to, I'm sorry, I have to just say, I don't mean to disagree with you, but I have to disagree with you on something. <laughs> Yes, they have rules, but once again, they're people. Do they make mistakes? Hell yes. How many times have you seen, you go, wait a minute, there's no way that property sold for that price. And you know why? Because the person typed in an extra zero and they left it there. Or left a zero out. Or something like that too. Because why they're an agent. Sure, their broker has rules, but do they check them? Nope. Do they make mistakes? Yep. So it's it happens. So I'm just, that's back to my thing. It's real people. 
I go for the, I look for the, the general consensus. Like, all right, more than half of them, here's the situation. And here, more than half of them, whatever, that's how, what I would, that's what I would recommend. So just know that. Thank you, Kevin. Good question. <laughs> Today's topic, why land ownership is ideal against fighting 2023 inflation. This is the meat of the show. I would like to start. Sure. Oh, and like I was saying, what a great place to be, especially right now, owning a bunch of land the way we do, where we know how you bought it. It was very inexpensive and you paid cash for it or somebody paid cash for it. Maybe your partner paid cash for it. Whatever it is, it's paid for. There's no financing, things like that. So if it takes three weeks or three months or you're waiting for the summer, it's not a bad place to be. And I'm gonna argue that, you know, right now we're watching the, you know, it's like the stock market. You know, you win money when there's all this volatility, that's when people make money. If it's just constant, it's hard to make money in these environments. But like in our world, I'm, I'm getting a little excited because I'm watching better deals happen. You know, we're, we're buying them in places that are even a little bit better than it was six months ago. And I'm selling them just fine because there's other people like me out there who are looking for some more land, you know, other investors that, and I, that's my favorite transaction is when I buy, I buy from the seller and then I queue it up and sell it to another investor because they have a long-term plan or something like that. It's great. So what's inflation? Inflation is the increase in price or cost of goods and services. Uh, if you look up the pure definition of that anywhere, that's what it is. A loaf of bread uh, three months ago co costed less than it does now. It, inflation got a hold of it and a loaf of bread costs more. Next year, it, it's a pretty solid argument that a loaf of bread is going to cost more in 2023 than it does right now, which is the end of 2022. So why is land a good way to hedge that off? So if I bought a piece of property this year for $100,000 and all the price of everything is going up around me, everything, cars, precious metals, stock in the stock market, all of the, which are commodities that go up and down depending on what happens, those are all very affected. The components of those cars cost more. They're subject to inflation. All the things that companies do in the stock market, they're subject to inflation. Prices go up, they go down, whatever they're making or selling, they're, they're all subject to that. Your lonely little piece of land that you paid $100,000 for is subject to none of that. Nothing, with the possible exception of the tax bill might go up, which is relatively insignificant in most, most or all cases. Mm -hmm. And so, what does it cost to really own land? Nothing. The only thing it costs mm -hmm. is uh, the fact that you put a bunch of money into a piece of land and there maybe would have been something better to put it into. But the, we're here, we've created this environment to make sure you don't overspend on land. True. In the greatest of times, you're still buying land at 20 to 30% of its, of its actual retail value. True. So now when you spend $100,000 on a piece of property and do nothing except stare at it, in our case, we never go see it at all. It's just a number on a computer screen and it's worth $120,000, $130,000 uh, you know, the next year, subject to all of this inflationary nonsense that's going around. It's a great investment. Well, if I paid one hundred dollars for it, it's probably worth three fifty. I just checked interest rates on mutual funds because Jill and I are constantly, like everybody, wondering where we should put our money and why, and right. you know, filling up non-risk buckets and risk buckets and all of that. That's good, right? And you can effectively get a mutual fund for four to five percent right now, four percent, let's say. Mm -hmm. If I buy a piece of property for a hundred thousand dollars, that's worth two hundred when I buy it, right? And then the inflation gets, you know, the value of the property either holds or goes higher on that $200 value, $200,000 valuation that I just spent $100,000 for, what's it gonna be worth next year? Right. 220, 230? And I have $100,000 into it and it costs me nothing to operate it. Mm -hmm. If you're uh, bored, please go on to Google and, and ask what the best, just type in questions like this, best thing to buy during inflationary times. 
land. That's a good one. I haven't done that. I will Google that. <laughs> That's cool. But There's you know, you things. watch. Everybody, nobody argues this. Everybody, everybody agrees. Who always makes the most money? Oh, the guys that own real estate. L- yeah. Land specifically. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. True. I'm not dealing with tenants that don't pay and need to get evicted. Like, imagine all that too, by the way. We haven't even touched on that. That's one of the beautiful things about land. Houses are subject a little bit more um, to inflationary issues. But, right. you know, houses are great too, especially if they're rented out. And especially if you paid cash or if you have a That's fixed a lot of it. fixed mortgage. Right. Those are really good inflationary hedges also. Yeah. Thanks. Happy you could join us today, five days a week. You can find us here on the Land Academy Show. Tomorrow's Jack Thursday, and I'm going to talk about why creating a subdivision is so alluring. You are not alone in your real estate ambition. You know, it's funny. So many people come into Land Academy and they're like, I need to do something. I need to do something more than just buy it and sell it. I'm like, I know. It's, why is it's that? It's the silliest thing. I don't get it. I don't. I think you should it. expound upon that uh, because I, I think I have easy. always wondered this too. I think uh, that's what it is. Well, I think it's because a lot of people come to us from other real estate. They're professionals in other real estate niches and they realize that this is a way to buy property or you know any kind of a real estate thing whether it's an apartment building or a piece of land in a better way so then they're but and they're so used to doing so much more work they don't quite get it so they're looking for something else to do i'm like so if that's you i personally don't have that problem i personally <laughs> I like to buy a beautiful piece of property with nothing on it sell it and let the money go into the bank and then do that again and then all the while hmm i might be uh, away for Christmas, or I might be in my RV for two months. You know, that's how I like to roll. I don't need to be my, I don't need to do more to it to try to squeeze out a little more money or uh, give myself something to do. It's kind of funny. But I think this there was- is some money you can make in, and he'll talk about. I think the source of confusion is uh, in traditional real estate, there's two components. There's that balance sheet component and the income statement uh, component. I'll use a house as, as an example. You buy a house for cash and you rent it out. Let's say you buy a house for hundred grand, you rent it out for $1,000 a month. You write a $100,000 check and then you have a, theoretically a $1,000 check coming in every month in the simplest of, of terms. Uh, while they're paying, while the tenants in there paying you, well, whatever, twelve thousand dollars a year, the value, the balance sheet of the whole uh, operation is going up for three, four, five, ten percent a year, whatever the market dictates. So there's that dual component. So you've got income coming in, and you have equity being built all at the same time for doing relatively little. Theoretically, it's never little. It's it's always a lot. Yeah. With land, it's a single uh, component scenario. There's, it's just a balance sheet, but you turn that into an income statement. I've been arguing this for years and years and years, and it's what you're right. People mm-hmm. have a, a difficult time digesting this. Exactly. Your balance sheet becomes your income statement. They become one because you're just constantly buying and selling land mm-hmm. and creating your balance sheet is, a, is a, a combination of cash and land that just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Exactly. Thank you. Hey, thanks for tuning in. We'd love to connect with you, by the way, on Clubhouse. It's awesome. It's your way to go on right now and talk to us live when we're there. So join us every first and third Thursday at 12 o'clock Pacific time in the Land Investing Club. We are Jack and Jill. Information and inspiration to buy undervalued property. We hope you find our content valuable and we appreciate your support. If you have not already, please check out our channel and hit the subscribe button. And your comments and suggestions help us uh, to create the content you're here for. Hitting the like button helps to support our channel's algorithm and gauge your interest for future shows.